congratulations on making it this far on the uh, first day of RubyConf. I know it can uh, sometimes be a little overwhelming, the start of the conference, all the excitement and everything. Um, just wanted to start off with a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Joshua Belanco. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I don't say that much, but uh, I tweet under Manhattan Metric. And on GitHub, you can find me under jbelank. I am a software engineer for Patch, which is a hyperlocal news service, and it is owned and run by AOL. I also happen to be a member of the MacRuby core team, and uh, if you grab me after the talk and talk to me for any length of time, I will probably end up bringing up MacRuby at some point. Um, I, I really enjoy that project. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Today, I want to talk about keeping Ruby reasonable. OK, so before we get into it, what do I mean by reasonable? Well, there's the standard dictionary definition, something based on good sense, a reasonable price, reasonable expectations. And that applies to Ruby and programming in general. But I wanted to take it actually a step further and uh, sort of give it a double meaning. And I also want to talk about keeping Ruby reasonable in the context of being able to reason about Ruby. So to start this discussion, and, and by the way, I should mention, I, I do want this to be a discussion. Uh, in fact, I had a lot of material. I shaved it down, left plenty of time at the end for uh, questions, comments. I honestly, I, I, I will jump to the end and tell you I don't have a good conclusion to this talk. Um, I wanted it to be a conversation starter. So if I can do that, then I will consider it a success. Um, but I'd like to start the conversation with a story. So the story starts with a Ruby programmer. goes by the name Ruby Reasoner. He wanted to write a class. Now this is a very simple class. It's got two methods. It's a greeter. Depending on the time of day, it's going to greet you with the appropriate greeting. And then we throw in a little loop at the bottom so we can do some I.O., present a prompt, get the response, present the proper greeting by calling a method on an instance of the class. So Ruby Reasoner wrote this, and he was pretty proud of it. And his friend came along, Peter Pythonista. And his friend Peter Pythonista wanted to help. I said, hey, Ruby Reasoner, I got something for you. I've got a library that I call Fancy Pants. Here's what you do. You call the fancify method and pass it a block. Whatever you put in that block, we're going to fancify it. So Ruby Reasoner said, hey, that's, that sounds like a good idea. I'll go ahead. I'll throw that in my uh, greeter class, make a fancy greeter, and then uh, I'll go ahead and run it. And this is what happens. So he goes into his directory, runs his fancy greeter, gets a nice prompt. Yeah, it's, uh, it's morning. OK, good night. Uh, it's in the evening. Oh, look, hey, that's pretty fancy. And then, uh, hmm, that's an interesting error. Let's try this again. All right, uh, let's start PM this time. Oh, OK, uh, try it again just to make sure. Yep, OK. Everything looks like it's working fine. That was a weird bug. I don't understand where that came from, but uh, uh, uh. that's a really interesting error message. Wrong number of arguments. One for 190. What the heck is going on? Well, at this point, Ruby Reasoner got a little suspicious of his friend and decided to take a look inside of that library. And here's what he found. So at the top, <laughs> we're fancifying things, right? That's easy. But then, look at what Peter Pythonist has done to our friend. He's going to spawn a thread. He's going to sleep for a random amount of time. Then he's going to take the block that Ruby Reasoner so naively passed to this method. He's going to steal the binding from that block, pick a random method out of it, and then redefine it with a somewhat reasonably looking <laughs> error message, right? Completely redefined the class method. 
And the thing about Ruby is that you can do this. It's completely legitimate Ruby code. <clears throat> Ruby, we need to talk. We need to have a conversation because as programmers, we very frequently find ourselves asking this question. What does it mean? Chances are if you do development as a career or even as a hobby, you probably end up reading more code than you write. And even the code that you do write, at some point you're probably going to go back and read it. And very often when you read this code, you find yourself asking, what does it mean? So one plus one, what does it mean? Well, maybe it's just a math equation. That's easy, one plus one, two, done. Maybe it's a program. Hmm, what if we look at this? Okay, now that definitely looks like a program. That's no math I'm familiar with. So the next thing we might jump to is, okay, well, if it's a program, what's the language? Right? And if, if you tell me what language it is, I can start to understand bits and pieces. I can pick out the tokens, I can find the symbols, right? The basic tokenization, uh, parsing style stuff that a language does. But that's not really what the program means. What the program means, what it does, depends on the functions, depends on the semantics, depends on how we do value transformations. And if we take all of these together, all of the information that we need in order to understand what a program actually does, we can call that an environment. So when you want to answer the question, what does it mean, you need to know something about the environment that code is going to run in. Okay. Uh, in honor of the Ruby Rogues. Can we get a definition to start this off? Okay, a couple of definitions in fact because um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, use language that's a little more sort of universally applicable which is slightly different than the language that Ruby uses to refer to the same things. So before I get into that, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So first of all, something like this, A gets one. That's what we call a binding, okay? We now have a variable A that is bound to a value one. We have a variable B which is bound to a string object. And that string object's value is hello world, right? So when you take all of these together, all of the bindings together that are in a scope, we can call that an environment. And it's these bindings which allow us to make sense of code, right? Because it's all about grabbing the bindings and then the values, the functions, whatever it might be that associate with them. Okay, so when we say an environment, what we're talking about is the collection of bindings. Now, you're all probably familiar with the concept of a closure, whether you realize it or not. Anytime you do an do end block in Ruby, you've created a closure. And in Ruby, we have this method, unfortunately named binding, because it makes things a little confusing, but that binding is actually uh, not returning a binding, it's returning an environment. It's returning all of the bindings, right? And it does so as an object, and this we'll call a first-class environment. So environment is to first-class environment the same way that function is to first-class function. If you've ever heard that concept, uh, for example, in Python, you can use functions as values. You can assign them to variables, you can pass them around. It's the same idea in Ruby and first class environments, right? An environment is the collection of all of the bindings and a scope. A first class environment is an environment that you lift out of place, make an object, and then you can pass it around and do things with it. Okay, so with those definitions out of the way, I want to talk about what motivated me, right? I, I've been very encouraged. A lot of the talks have been uh, people pulling other sources, and uh, I think it's good that we learn from other sources. And in this case, I, I was originally inspired to do this talk by a series of blog posts uh, from 2009. Uh, it's a really good blog um, by a guy named uh, Joe Marshall. He's a core contributor to MIT Scheme. And the subject of these series of blog posts that he wrote in this time referred back to the scheme standardization process. So if you're not familiar with scheme, scheme actually has a standard. They have a committee that gets together and agrees on a standard and every so often they 
reconvene and they revise it. So they're now currently on the sixth revision, which we sometimes call the R6 RS. And oh yes, R7 is currently in process. So R6 is the most recently ratified, I believe. Um, so anyway, in the R6 RS ratification process, the discussions that were happening surrounding scheme, one of the big debates was on the concept of first class environments. Should we have them? How should they behave? And in these series of blog posts, uh, Joe Marshall does a really great deconstruction of them. And, and in the um, final blog post, he comes to the conclusion where he says, I really liked first class environments when I was first exposed to them. At this point, I believe that first class environments are useless at best and dangerous at worst. You kind of saw that at that first example that I, I showed you. But Let's delve in a little further and understand what exactly he means by this. So in trying to define the behavior and the semantics of first class environments, uh, in this blog post, Joe breaks it down into four essential questions that you have to be able to answer about the behavior of a first class environment. OK, so first, should you be able to extract an environment from any closure? That is, any time we close around a scope, should we expect to be able to get all of the bindings from that scope at any later point in time? Yes or no, right? Well, Ruby, Ruby says yes. Now, keep this in mind, because we'll come back to the implications, maybe the unintended implications of making this decision a little later. OK, next question. When we get a first class environment, should all of the bindings that are in scope at the time the closure is formed, should all of them be in that first class environment? You could say, yeah, sure. Everything that's in scope when you make that closure, when you get the first class environment from that closure, all of those bindings are still available. Or we could say, no, no, no. Inside your closure, you're using some of those bindings. We're only going to get those. Right? Or maybe we make you tell us which bindings should be explicitly carried across in the first class environment. Of course, Ruby says all of them. Anything that's in scope at the time you form a closure, when you get the environment from that closure, they're all still valid. OK, now that we've got our bindings, are they going to be live? Right? That is, are, they, are we just capturing the value Right? So, so we could say, yes, all of the bindings are live. They're all mutable. So you can query any value. If another part of the program updates the value, that's reflected in the first class environment. If you have a handle on the first class environment, you can go in, you can redefine things. Or we can be more restrictive. We can say that bindings are, are live, right? So if they change somewhere else in the program, then that's reflected in the first class environment. But if you have a handle on the first class environment, you're not allowed to manipulate them. Right? Or we could just make our first class environment snapshots, right? just collections of values at the time the closure was created. Or we could do some sort of user specified version of that. Of course, Ruby, again, says all of those bindings, they're all live, they're all mutable. Right? That's how I was able to redefine that method, just by having the binding for that block. OK, what happens if you have a first class environment and you define a new binding? Right? Does the new binding shadow any older binding? Right? So when you redefine the method, is that method redefined everywhere in that environment? Maybe you clone the environment. And the new binding is only available in the clone, right? So behind the scenes, you're duping the environment and putting the new binding in there. Or maybe you just simply say, look, I'll give you the environment, but you don't get to manipulate it. It's not mutable. Again, right? Ruby chooses one. Because when I grab that binding and redefine that method, the class, which originally had the original method, saw my redefined method. So after iterating through these four questions, this is the conclusion that Joe comes to in his blog post. 
When someone suggests first class environments, I assume they want options 1, 1, 1, and 1. In this variation, though, the user simply cannot reason about his code. And, and he goes and he, he decomposes that a little bit. He's saying, essentially, once you've done that, any time you create a closure and hand that closure off to another piece of code, that's it. Game's over. You can no longer guarantee the behavior of any other piece of your code. <clears throat> Ruby chooses options 1, 1, 1, and 1, right? And, and again, it's very understandable when you approach these questions one at a time. Right? Why, why wouldn't I allow all of the bindings to be in scope? Why wouldn't I allow them to all be mutable? It's only when you consider them as a whole and the implication of choosing one for all of those questions that you understand just how dangerous this is. Okay, so this is the problem. What do we do about it? Well, as I said, these, uh, these blog posts were part of a discussion around the R6RS process, and they eventually did come to a conclusion. This is their conclusion. Um, you can find all the details, all the gory details on uh, their website, which is actually really a great read if you ever have a spare week. Um, <laughs> this is about what it'll take. Um, but essentially, so they've got an eval method, right? That second line there. The third line is what we're evaling. And then the fourth through sixth lines, those are the environment definition. And essentially what we're doing is um, we're using library references. So Scheme introduced this concept of library references. Uh, most of your code will be encapsulated in a library. And so RNRS is a library. And then they have various forms on the library. So you can say, out of this library, only grab these bindings, right? Um, prefix all of the bindings with a token. So that's why in our eval line on, on line three, we're calling eval car and eval, eval cons, right? And not uh, car and cons. You can also uh, rename. You can also limit, right? So you can take all the bindings except for these bindings. So they have a series of forms which are really nice for manipulating these. Um, importantly though, you can't create any new bindings in an environment. So you can get the environment from a library, that's fine. You can get all the bindings, you can use their values, can't change them. Another, uh, another example I wanted to bring up was Objective-C, and now this is a little weird probably because Objective-C doesn't actually have first class environments, mostly because Objective-C doesn't have eval or any concept of eval. Um, but as I was pointing out in the definitions, a first class environment is just an environment that you are able to lift out of a closure. If you have closures, you still have a concept of environments. And Objective-C does have closures now with blocks, and therefore does have a concept of environments for those blocks. And I kind of like what Objective-C does, because when you declare these variables, right? So here are our bindings. We've got a name. We've got to create it out. We've got things. Then we're going to create a closure, right? And what happens is if we reference one of these bindings inside the closure, Name gets automatically retained when we do our block copy right before returning, right? So we retain it, but we retain it in a read-only form. If, however, we declare something under, under block, then when we reference it in the closure, not only do we retain it, but it's also live. We can manipulate it. We can mutate it. Finally, if we have a variable that's declared in scope but is not actually captured in the closure, it's released or garbage collected, depending on your mode. And it goes away. Right, so this is kind of a nice, uh, you know, it puts a little bit more work on the programmer, a little bit more work on the compiler. You have to resolve symbols and whatnot. But uh, it, it's a nice, I feel, happy medium for how to have environments but still keep things sensible. OK, so, so far this is all sort of pie in the sky, language design type stuff. I just want to write code, right? And I'm not going to do anything stupid like that first file where you know, I created a thread and grabbed a binding and redefined things. That's dumb. How is this going to affect me? Well, how many times have you done this, right? You've got, uh, let's say you're doing a, a Rails app and you need a before filter and around filter or something on a named scope. Right, so uh, you're going you're gonna to create a proc. 
to use for that. But to create the proc, you have a process that you have to go through. There's a lot of data involved. Maybe you have to go out to a service, get stuff, and then you have to parse a, a DOM or who knows what until you find the thing that you actually need. And then you say, but, but, but trust me, this filter is really easy. It's just an equivalence check. Well, guess what? Because anybody who gets a handle on that proc could call binding on it and could reasonably, according to Ruby, expect to grab any of these other variables, they all remain live so long as your proc remains live. Your giant data, your big DOM, all the parser, they aren't going to get collected. So you thought you were safe by just passing on a little tiny proc. Mm -mm. That proc carries a lot of baggage with it. OK, now this is a, an honest question. I said I wanted to start a conversation. This is an honest question because I don't have an answer to this, but I, I would love for somebody to tell me otherwise. So let's say you have a method that's going to return a proc. You define a couple of variables, and then you return the proc. And you don't refer to any of those variables inside of the proc. And then later on, whoops. And then later on, you uh, take the proc, you grab the binding, and you eval to change the variable that wasn't referred to in the proc. You can do this in Ruby. Um, I don't know if anybody does. I, I honestly don't even know if that's reasonable. This is really magic, you know, far-reaching effects. Um, and if you're not going to do that, then we could probably remove the need to be able to do that. Right? Now, that said, if somebody does do something along these lines, I'd love to know about it. I'd, I'd love to see what the use case is. Um, I, I think it would certainly make me maybe a little smarter. OK, lots of talk about first class environments. Um, don't want to leave you on a, a sour note, so let's finish up by playing a game. We're going to play Capture the Flag. Here are the rules. You need to provide a class. Class needs to have a method. Method name is flag. I'm going to try and capture it. Class must also contain a class constant called base, and that constant has to be a proc. It has to be an instance of a proc object. You can only define one class. You cannot require or load other source files. You can't do any funny stuff. Okay, no funny stuff, just a class with a constant and a method. And this is the game we're going to play. So you're going to pass me the name of your class on the command line. I'm going to require its file, and then I'm going to create a new instance of my game class with your class. First, I'm going to check, make sure you're not cheating. Make sure you've got that class level constant and that it is a proc. Then we're going to play the game. I'm going to use that proc to grab a binding, first class environment, and I'm going to eval a redefinition of your flag method. And then we're going to call that method and see if I captured your flag. OK, blue team, you're up. Blue team went for the straightforward solution. I got a method, I got a proc. What happens? So we run the game. Oh, captured. <laughs> that proc carried around a first class environment which exposed the entire internal workings of that class. So the game was able to just redefine methods willy nilly whenever you like. Red team. You're up. Ah, red team is a little sly about this. Red team is going to create a class level method called hidden base. Then it's going to use the method method to get a handle on that method. Keeping, keeping up here? Get a, get a method and then call to proc, right? This is just method to proc. If you've ever done a map or an each, you've done the ampersand colon, you've used method to proc. Okay, so we're just writing it out here, just method to proc. And when you do that, base is still an instance of the class proc, right? But what happens when we play the game? Aha, 
Right? Team wins. But why? Why did that work? Right? Why did calling the method method to create a proc from a method, why did that work when just simply creating a proc didn't? Let's send in a spy, see what's going on. So our spy is real simple. Our spy is just going to grab the base, and instead of trying to redefine things in an eval, we're just going to query what, what is self and what is the class of self. OK, so if we do this, for the blue team, self is blue team, the class. right? And it is an instance of class. right? They just exposed their entire class through the binding. Red team, on the other hand, that proc that they passed, its environment says, I am an instance of a method class. My class is method, not class. Ah, tricky. But Ruby actually has two concepts of first class environments when you think about it this way, right? Because um, the method method, in a sense, gets an environment by, by using the method method and calling to proc. So method to proc gives you a proc. Right? That proc has an environment, but it's not mutable. It's not even accessible, really. By calling binding, you're getting some method object and method class. But when you take that method to proc proc and pass it to another thing, you can call it, and it has its entire environment to execute its call. Right. So if you do something like a through z, dot map upcase, right? Method to proc on upcase. It's taking that upcase method and carrying around enough environment to know that this is a, a string that we need to call the string upcase on it. Right? So, so method objects are a kind of, if you look at them sideways, they're a kind of first class environment that's far, far, far more restricted than the first class environment you get by calling binding on a proc. So Ruby kind of already has both extremes. So I told you I didn't have a really satisfying conclusion, because I don't really have a patch to, to cure the ills of Ruby's first class environments. Uh, this is a difficult problem, and it's going to take a lot of thinking and a lot of work and, and looking at the internals um, to see how this, you know, how this should be resolved. But, I think what we can at least learn from looking at this initially is that the first class environments as they exist in Ruby today, they're kind of dangerous. They're kind of really dangerous. It means that once you pass a proc to any other method, you can no longer reason about your code. And not just you, right? I trust you're all good programmers. You're not going to do anything like that first library class that I showed you. But it's not just you that we need to worry about, right? The Ruby runtime can't trust you. There's no mechanism. You know, you can, you can hand me a piece of code and say, trust me. I didn't do anything ridiculous. But the Ruby runtime has no way for you to say, Ruby, trust me. You don't have to get all of those bindings. I'm not using them. I didn't do anything silly like that, right? Maybe we need to give the Ruby runtime a way to, to understand that we aren't trying to do anything silly. We also kind of have an eye to a way that we might be able to get to something more sensible with the method class. right? In fact, I think if we found a happy medium, it would benefit both first class environments on procs and also the method objects that you get from calling the method method. Because currently, when you call the method method, right, you can turn that method into a proc. You can unbind that method from its class, from its object. Right? When you unbind that method, the only thing you can do is rebind it to another instance of the same class or subclass of that class. Now, let's think about this. Unless you've dynamically defined that method after instantiation, you're saying that a method that I declared in a class, I can pull off of an object and put onto another object, which probably already has that method. Or I can put it on a subclass, which probably also already has that method. Not very useful. What I'd really like to do is be able to grab a method from one object, put it on a completely different object. But I can't do that currently 
because the method object has this severely tightened down first class environment concept, right? In fact, I think if you look under the hood, there, is no, there isn't actually an environment there. There's simply a name of a class and the method object says, don't bind me to anything that's not this class, right? So I think by rethinking and formalizing, right? Because the other thing is, is I don't think anybody intentionally decided that first class environments in Ruby should operate this way. I think it's a consequence of sort of iterative design of a language. Like I said, when you take each of those four questions one at a time, it seems reasonable to choose option one for each of them. It's only when you look at them in aggregate that you realize what the danger is and just how much trouble you can get in. So I think what happened with Ruby is that the language naturally developed and evolved to have first class environments of a variety that are very dangerous. And maybe it's time that we take another look at first class environments. It would mean that we could make more sense of our code. It would mean that we could optimize our code. There are a number of optimizations, right? Part, part of the material that I had to cut out of this talk was a deep dive into a method call and what actually happens when you call a method in Ruby. When you look at that, right, that's a, that's a very long function, C function, if you pull it up in uh, C Ruby. Um, and there are all kinds of checks. Was the class redefined? Was method redefined? Did somebody move my environment? Did somebody move my chair? Right? There's all this paranoia that Ruby has because everything is so flexible. Right? If we can remove some of that by making things slightly less flexible, then we could potentially optimize code way more than we do currently. OK, well, that's all I got. Um, oops. Um, I, I did put the uh, code snippets that I presented up on my GitHub account in case you wanted to play around with them. Uh, the blog that I mentioned, Joe Marshall's blog, very excellent blog. He doesn't post frequently, but when he does, they're almost always gems. He has a really good series on persistence, too. Um, that's at funcall.blogspot.com. It is all schemed, so there is that. But, um, and then I actually put up a, a couple of public links on my pin board uh, under the tag Keeping Ruby Reasonable. Uh, it's all of the blog posts that inspired this along with uh, some of the R6RS, R5RS, uh, um, the documents, some of the discussion, and a couple of other resources if you want to get into this and learn more. Uh, and with that, I would gladly take any questions and uh, hopefully start a discussion. Yeah, um, one of the things that I noticed prior to the R6RS was um, the difficulties in actually writing compilers. And one of the things I've, I've noticed about R6RS R6, is what it really did is it, it actually shortened the ability to write optimizing compilers, whereas having dynamic environments really didn't allow that. And so I think what happened after R6RS was it allowed people to write efficient compilers, which in turn could compile and interpret. And so effectively it allows eval to be written efficiently. Um, given that uh, first class environments of Ruby are so open, I, I wonder if anybody in the JRuby or Rubinius community has any comments on it. the difficulties of effectively writing compilers. <laughs> well, I, okay, so, so the question is regarding uh, uh, writing compilers um, and uh, how difficult it is given the openness. Um, so I can give you the MacRuby perspective. Um, MacRuby didn't have the binding method for the first two years of its life. Uh, even today, if you try, I'm sure you will find bucket loads of bugs. Uh, and every time I uh, asked Laurent, who's the lead developer on MacRuby, what about binding? He wouldn't talk to me for a week. <laughs> um, <laughs> You can do a lot without the binding method, right? We got two years into MacRuby. We were developing actual production software, some of which shipped on Lion, um, never having to touch binding. I actually was talking to somebody who wasn't familiar with Ruby, and I, I mentioned that I was giving this talk, and uh, they asked me about the topic, and you know, started going into first class environments. Why do you even need that? And I thought about it, why do we even need that? The most obvious thing I can think of is ERB, a templating language. Well, or to get self of proc. Yeah, or to get self of proc, which is, you know. Primary. Right. Other, 
Uh, IRB, but even IRB you can do without. So, so the other thing that you mentioned was eval. And I guess I should mention that eval existed in Scheme long before first class environments because you don't actually need first class environments for eval, right? You can simply decide that eval will work in the current lexical scope, which is the way that eval normally works. Normally when you call eval in Ruby, there is a hidden uh, argument that most people never bother with, which is binding, which if you don't specify the binding, it just grabs the current binding. Right? The current lexical scope is what your eval is using. Right? So eval is different from eval with first class environments. Eval with first class environments um, implies that you can take one piece of code and execute it as if it were in a completely different spot in the program. Right? Um, so many languages without first class environments have REPLs. Yes, IRB can do some really fancy things uh, with uh, the first class environments. And, and, and by the way, I mean, obviously there was a desire to have first class environments, right? It's not that there are no benefits. Uh, it's just a matter of when you weigh the benefits to the risks uh, and, and the openness that a first class environment presents. Um, what it does to the ability to form compilers, what it does to the ability to reason about code, to optimize. Yeah, you really seriously got to think about whether or not it's worth having. Uh, and in terms of writing Ruby compilers, uh, so I, 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 I'm pretty sure Rubinius, I know Mac Ruby does, JRuby does. Um, they all end up being bytecode compilers. And somewhere in the bytecode ends up being a way to, for example, in Mac Ruby, if you include eval and a string, we just put the string in the data section of the object file and we reference it from the bytecode and we spin up a full version of the Mac Ruby interpreter and just interpret the code live. Um, which is unfortunate, right? It would be nice to be able to make that more efficient. Um, but because we, we will have no guarantees on the environment at the time you call eval, right, what you're passing in, the only way we can do it is to actually run it in C2. Did the Scheme community score into this results in any apples to apples comparisons of how much more efficient a compiler can be? Oh. <laughs> Yeah. It, yeah, there were a lot of changes. It's a little difficult, um, specifically because the scheme community is uh, a bit, bit of an esoteric entity within itself. Um, uh, there was a lot of contention around the R6RS. Uh, for example, MIT Scheme just flat out declared they are not going to implement it. They're going to stick with R5RS and wait and see what happens in the future. Um, seven is addressing a lot of those concerns. Seven is hopefully addressing a lot of those concerns. Um, I mean, part of it also is that uh, the Scheme community, I mean, actually, we could probably learn something from the Scheme community because They've always focused on standardizing the smallest subset of scheme that you can basically equate languages and say this is a scheme, this is a scheme, this is a scheme. Until right? six. Uh, until six, right? And this is the contention that a lot of people came up with six is six is the first time that they actually forayed into trying to standardize the libraries. And there was a lot of contention about whether or not that was a good idea, whether or not you, know, you were doing it the right way. So I'd like to address Sure. issues which people would bring up as other reasons that MRI is slow. Uh, for example, there, a lot of the confusion surrounding constant resolution um, is somewhat related in that there are multiple paths to a constant, right? Because 
you leave so many nodes live and you can basically, uh, okay, so I guess I, <laughs> I should explain what I mean. When you have a constant, right, when you declare a constant, that constant has a certain scope. And later on in your program, when you want to get that constant, you have to come up with a way to refer to it. Well, Ruby actually has a myriad of rules on how to get at those constants. There's a, just a ton of ways because basically, constant resolution in Ruby is a matter of walking the nodes where different scopes are defined until you get to the constant that you're looking for. And if you walk the nodes in a certain way and don't find the constant, then you go back and you walk them in a different way to try and find the constant. And then you go back and you walk them a different way. What this means is that um, so long as those nodes remain live and mutable, you have to walk them every time to find this constant. You can't do constant folding for most practical purposes. Now, I know uh, Charles Nutter has a really neat thing that he's done with uh, Invoke Dynamic to make it slightly um, reasonable to constant fold in JRuby. And that's a great advance. But the bottom line is, is that there's still way too many ways that you can uh, screw up that optimization and then you're back to walking all the nodes to find your constants again. Um, so yeah, I mean, first class environments are not the only reason that Ruby is slow. But I, I feel like addressing it would be a good first foray into figuring out how to make Ruby more efficient. Just, just to clarify, when you say reason about code, are you referring to from the user's Both. Uh, it, it's really the same thing. Um, the advantage that humans have is that they're humans, and they can converse in human languages and say, no, seriously, I didn't do anything funky with your environment. Um, but I've seen plenty of places where people unintentionally do funky things with their environment and screw things up. And those bugs are the hardest to find because you know, the, the, the first thing you want to do when you hit a bug is find out where. Where did it occur? And I don't know if you noticed, but that first example that I ran, right, when it threw that exception, if you looked at the backtrace of that exception, it looked like it was occurring at the original method definition in the code. So you would stare at that all day and never understand why that method threw that exception. You have to walk through all of the other code to figure it out. And those are the worst bugs to fix, are the ones where you really seriously have to investigate the entire source base to figure out what's going wrong. So from the user perspective, yes, but also from the compiler perspective. Right? Compilers can run algorithms, they can run heuristics, they can speculatively optimize things, but at the end of the day, if a compiler can't be confident in the conclusions that it's reached about a piece of code, uh, it's going to be slower than if it was confident about what a piece of code meant. Other questions? Right, so yeah, so the comment was that bindings are not the only reason that Ruby, card is, Ruby code is hard to reason about, or the first class environments, and that is true, right? I mean, if you look at languages like Pascal, where you have a proof system built into the runtime, or actually the compiler, um, yes, there is a lot that you could do to do more reasoning about Ruby code. Um, I guess what I was trying to bring, uh, uh, bring up in terms of first class environments is that there's a spectrum of how much reasoning you can do about code, right? Uh, a classic example in Ruby is uh, it's very difficult to determine whether something is a method call or a, a variable reference, right? If I write foo, am I calling the foo method or am I referring to the foo variable, right? That's an ambiguity that's baked into the Ruby language and I think some would argue that that's an acceptable ambiguity. It allows me to not have to put parens on all my function calls, and maybe I like saving two keystrokes. Uh, or maybe I like the way the code looks. It does look better. I, I love the way Ruby looks. Um, so there is a scale of how much reasoning you can do about your code. 
I think what I was trying to point out with first class environments is first class environments put us at the bottom. You cannot know anything about your code. Like, let's not even worry about uh, type inference. Let's not even worry about you know, any sort of proof system. With first class environments running around, you can't guarantee anything. So I guess the, the thing, um, so Matt Imanetti has a really great blog post that he did recently where he was looking at a DSL that he developed um, and he was using uh, prox in the DSL and he did some benchmarking and he found out that uh, the, the prox were uh, you know, not really a, a good choice and the way that he was using them was not great. Um, so really the, the, I guess the uh, moral of the story is be careful when you use prox. Right? It's not just first class environments. Um, there are other things about props that make them uh, kind of dangerous. Uh, the other thing that you can do is, for example, if you find yourself doing anything like this, where you're hoping to pass along a little bit of code to be executed later, right, and you know that you don't need any of these references, what you could do here is right before the proc return, you could just nil out all of those variables, and then they would all get collected. So, so that, would, that would be like, you know, if you want to take something practical away from this. Um, <laughs> when you're done with a variable, if you're going to return a proc, nil it out. Um, or move it to another scope. Or, yeah, put it in another scope where you can't reach it from the procs. Like, you can't be in a college scope because that's also probably closed over. Yeah, that's the other problem is that you sometimes close over scopes when you don't intend to. Um, Self is always good. Yeah. 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 Self is, yeah. And, and uh, define method. Uh, if you've ever benchmarked a method, right, write the same method using def and define method, and they don't run with the same performance. Or you can always define a method called nil proc that takes an argument, then it uses the binding to call local variables, and then you balance them to nil. <laughs> well, you could. <laughs> that would be very interesting. So. Okay, um, I, I think we're probably way out of time, so thank you all. Um.